Patterson. During your first title reign, boxing fans never quite forgave you for not defending your title against Eddie Macon and Zora Foley, despite both men being top contenders for the title. Instead of facing them, you fought Roy Harris, Tom McNeely, and Brian London. Why didn't you fight Eddie Macon or Zora Foley? Well, they were controlled by the powerful International Boxing Club, which had a stranglehold on the U.S. fight game in the 1950s until they were ordered to disband by a Senate commission investigating monopolies. I didn't fight Foley or Macon because the IBC didn't let me. The choice was to be ridiculed by the press or controlled by the IBC. People didn't realize what was going on behind the scenes, but there's one thing they can't take away from me. I was the heavyweight champion. How was your childhood, Floyd? I just knew poverty and poverty. I'd done mischievous things, played hooky from school, ran away from home. I became quiet. I figured if I didn't speak, I couldn't say anything stupid. I was the dullest boy in class. I wouldn't answer any questions, wouldn't raise my hand. I always felt dumb, ignorant. There was a series of things that made me accept the fact that I wasn't too bright. Once I stole a whole box of ice cream, I took it to the place I was hiding, way back of a subway where the workmen took their tools. It was in the summer, and I was going to come back at night and eat the ice cream. But of course, it melted. I was always sort of wandering. I would steal fruit from the grocery stores just to eat, to survive. I felt guilty, like a parasite. At the age of nine, I got the realization of this. I felt guilty just being there and boxing. I found something in this life I could do as well as the next guy. Tell me about your relationship with Custom Auto. We never had a contract. My word was my bond. Give us your thoughts on your trilogy of fights with Ingemar Johansson. A lot of weird things happened in our first fight. I didn't have much respect for him. I went into the ring with the intentions of disposing him right away. You never underestimate an opponent, but I dare underestimate Ingemar. When he knocked me down the first time, I didn't know I'd been down. All I know, I was standing there. I heard the referee say, three, four, five. So I assumed I would knocked Ingemar down. So I went to walk to a neutral corner. That's when Ingemar came from the back of the other side of me and knocked me down again. And I still didn't know I was down. When you come to, it's weird. If you're on your feet, you don't remember being down. John Wayne was my hero, and he was sitting at ringside. I was looking directly into his eyes. I looked up and saw the referee counting and realized I must be down. When it was all over, the most embarrassing thing was to walk back from the ring through the people to the dressing room. I wish there had been an underground tunnel so you could just drop out of sight and crawl back to the dressing room. Afterwards, the press were saying how good Johansson was and what a poor champion you had been. Your thoughts? One reporter said that Ingemar was a combination of Joe Lewis and Jack Dempsey. I went along with it because if I did happen to beat Ingemar in my next fight, I might not be as good as Ingemar, but then had to put me up there somewhere. Legend has it that you were obsessed with beating Ingemar in a rematch and beating him badly at that. Yes, not because of what he did to me. Don't misunderstand. Physical abuse doesn't mean that much to me. It was the mental anguish I went through. It was watching him on television, reading what he said about me. I had never met Ingemar Johansson before, but you'd think we'd been interviews for years about what he was saying about me. He was saying Floyd Patterson was a bad champion. He can't box. He can't punch. He never had one good word to say about me. Everything was derogatory. Ingemar kept saying this about me the whole year. 
I built up so much hate in me, I didn't think of the title. That was secondary. I just wanted to hit him as hard as I could, as many times as I could, so that if they should raise his hand in a victory, he would know he had been in the fight. That was all. And in the process, I won. That knockout in the fifth round was brutal. It may have been your biggest win and your biggest punch. When I saw Inga Macho Hansen laying down on the canvas with his foot quivering, blood coming out the side of his mouth, I was petrified. It hit me that maybe I'd killed him. Finally, he sat up and they sat him on his stool and he was still groggy. I've never been so happy to see a man get up. Now, despite popular belief, I heard that you weren't terrified of Sonny Liston. Is there any truth to that? I feel sorry for him. The press never really gave him a break. They never let him forget that he was once a convict. They never really gave him the credit that was due to him. It wasn't until he lost the crown and went to Las Vegas that you began to see pictures of Liston smiling. I think they treated him very poorly. I never had any personal contact with him, but I felt if they didn't criticize him so much, I felt he might would have been so different. He would have smiled a lot sooner. When I saw him get knocked out by Cassius Clay in Lewiston, Maine, I went back to his hotel. There weren't many people at his hotel. They were all over at Clay's hotel. I went up to his room and had a talk with him. I never had any conversation with him before, but I explained to him that I knew how he felt because I had experienced the same thing. I told him people who were with him before would still be with him. And I told him not to go into hiding as I did. Just go out and be yourself. Mr. Patterson, you brought a disguise with you to the first Sonny Liston fight. I heard that it was a fake mustache and beard. Was this so that you could sneak away unnoticed in case Sonny was to beat you? I had the same mustache and beard for the George Travalo fight. The same mustache and beard for several fights. But I never had a chance to wear it because I was winning. Every fight I fought with tremendous amount of confidence. Most fighters do. But you don't always win. There's still a reasonable doubt. But I carried the disguise because I feel like I let so many people down if I was beaten. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't wear the mustache and beard. But I'd be just as ashamed to get beaten. We grow up, but some of us grow up late. All right, man, let's get to it. Why do you still call Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay? Because his mother still calls him Cassius Clay. She gave him the name when he was born, and she still calls him that. When his mother calls him Muhammad Ali, I'll call him that. Other people resent the fact that I call him Cassius Clay, but yet they give him the right to call me the rabbit. They say he is doing it just for publicity reasons, but we haven't fought in goodness knows how long. And when I saw him three months ago, he still said, Hey, the rabbit. And I said, Hey, Cassius. He doesn't resent him. This isn't the right I'm asking for to call Ali Cassius Clay. I'm taking it. I fought Ali because I believed I could beat him. And I still feel like I could beat him. And I'm 43 now. My body has been beaten many times. And I hold the record for heavyweight champion for going down the most. But I've never been counted out on the canvas. I've been beaten many times physically, but never mentally, and that's important to me. I like Clay, and I feel that Clay likes me too. I just don't agree with the things he belongs to. We lead different lifestyles altogether. But as a person, I still like him. I respect Clay, and he respects me, despite calling me the rabbit. He's got names for all of his opponents, and with Cassius, you've got to expect something like that. Any chance of us seeing Floyd Patterson as heavyweight champion again? I entertained hopes of getting another shot at the heavyweight title up to three years ago. I would have liked to approve the point, not to the press or the people, just to me. I went much further than I ever expected to. I never even expected to win the New York Golden Gloves, much less the Olympics. And if you told me about the heavyweight championship, I'd say forget about it. And being the first person to win it back and the youngest man to win it, it just wasn't even in my dreams. You know, because of your body structure, you could have been the greatest light heavyweight of all time had you chosen to box in that division. What do you think? 
I still would rather just be heavyweight champion. To me, it's the top division. There's no other division like it. It's worldwide. When you become world heavyweight champion, everyone in the world knows who you are, even in Russia. I don't have to be a great fighter. Just to be heavyweight champion is enough. I sacrificed being the greatest light heavyweight who ever lived just to be heavyweight champion. Tell me something important about this business that you've learned outside of the ring. I learned from my cricket lawyer and cricket business advisor just to do the opposite of what they told me, and I come out on top. When I got rid of them in 1961 to 1962, everything was different from that point on. I left everything up to the office because I figured they represented me, but they represented themselves. So I decided to do it myself, and I did. You're a Roman Catholic, but you compete in a brutal sport. How strong is your faith? And does being a Catholic conflict with being a boxer? If the church bans boxing, I would quit boxing immediately. Yes, my religious beliefs are even stronger now than they've ever been. You've been married twice? I am in the process of which I have spoken to the Chancery, and there is a slight possibility I could possibly get my first marriage annulled. I don't feel the marriage was valid because we married when we were very young and we didn't know what we were doing. We finally did get married, we learned what we were doing, and we didn't like it. I like to receive communion with my two daughters, which I have now from this marriage. We were to church regularly, but I can't receive because I was married before. Do you ever feel 100%? I have never been more than 70% of myself. My ambition is to be 100%. 100% is a figure that we never reach, because once you reach it, you stop trying. What do you feel was the highest price you had to pay in boxing? That's a very good question. And I come to think in terms of what boxing did for me. I don't think it owes me anything. I think I owe it.